Hi and welcome back. We are going to play Pacific War, the struggle against Japan, 1941 to 1945. We are going to be playing the engagement scenario number three, the first invasion of Wake Island. Postulated playing time is 15 minutes. The number of players is one, the Japanese player only. Maps, map B only. The game length it should be one battle cycle. We have the special rules. One, the Japanese have the advantage. And two, the Japanese conduct three airstrikes prior to the beginning of the battle cycle. The victor conditions. The player wins if the Japanese control Wake Island. Hex 2942. That's located up here. By the end of the scenario, the player loses with any other result. We're just going to be playing this engagement scenario. Okay, here we go. This is engagement scenario number three, first invasion of Wake Island. The special rules for this scenario, the Japanese have the advantage, and the Japanese conduct three airstrikes prior to the beginning of the battle cycle. The Japanese player will win if he captures Wake Island. First off, we will resolve the three airstrikes versus uh, Wake Island and we will we'll be targeting the fortress which is right here we will target the fortress all ground units and all installations ports airfields, that kind of thing, are always auto-detected. In this case it won't matter really, other than I'm just going to go by the procedure of putting a task force marker on the map for the task force and a force marker for non-task force units. So, first thing will be the three airstrikes. I'm not going to move the aircraft for this, but technically I would move these guys over to Wake these are just holding boxes. Um, and then we'll conduct the three airstrikes against the uh, fortress. Let me get the combat results table out here. <clears throat> Let's see here. Alrighty. Let's see. Where do I put it? I put it here. Okay, so. What we're going to have is, I'll pull this back. What we're going to do is we're going to determine the strength of the attacking force. This is a 2L, 2 engine L1 bomber. It has a air attack of two, a naval attack of five, and a ground attack of five. However, its current strength is only three, because it has three hits under it. Each hit represents one step loss. Air units can take six step losses before they are eliminated, and for each step loss it uses, it loses one of its values for um, each of its attack strengths, except for range I think. Anyway, it has a strength of two, three, sorry. So what we're going to do is we're going to come across here to the three column, then we're going to roll a die. And wherever that die roll is, we'll go down the slant and then come down here and cross-reference with this here, air unit versus installation. So even at the best die roll, um, even at the best die roll, the most he could hope for is um, a three would be his best odds. So anyway, I'm gonna make three attacks against the board. First attack. Uh, just a minute here. Let me get my 
handy dandy fancy tray. First roll is a zero, and that's good. Go over to strength three, we'll go to zero, we'll slide all the way down to here on the green. Then we're going to come down here to installation, and that's two hits on the um, four at Wake Island. So we'll get a two hit marker out. A fortress takes uh, three hits before it's destroyed. And really the only value of a for fortress that I can tell is, or fortification, whatever, is that it just prevents units from retreating and I don't know what that deal means because you're not retreating off of Wake Island. So, anyway, the second task force die roll. If I roll the actual die onto the tray, is a five, and that is um, let's see, that will be probably a miss. On the three, we go down to five. Yes, four to nine is a no effect or a miss. So our third and final die roll is a six, so it also misses. So for all that, they did score a pretty good hit with two, um, two hits on that one strike, but the others were no good. All right, now we start off the battle cycle itself. We start with the lighting phase. For this scenario, it's going to be day. Um, normally, depending upon the operational intelligence level, one player or the other would be the, I'm not sure what it's called, but would be the operations player. And the other player would be the reaction player. But since this is just a simple solo game, I'm going to just say it's daytime and that'll have no effect on play at all. So then we're going to go down to advantage determination. According to special scenario rule number one, the Japanese have the advantage, so I don't have to worry about that. Then we go to the advantage movement. This is where the advantage player can move any ground or naval unit, but no air units. So we will, we are going to board, let's see if I can get down here to where we can see. We're going to put the Marine Battalion on this transport and put it in the core of Task Force 1. These units are in the screen. They'll get to use any kind of anti-aircraft factors um, first, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's a different value. I think it has to do with uh, anti-aircraft fire, really. So, the more on the screen, the better your anti-aircraft fire and such. Um, anyway, that's not, uh, not important at the moment, I guess. So, anyway, we're going to go and we're going to move Task Force 1, which is composed of these guys here, even though my writing at the top is, not, is something to be desired, leaves to be desired. Um, let's see, we would go zero, uh, we're going to move zero, one, and two hexes. In this case, the Allies could, if they wanted to, search this aircraft out to, let's see, one, two, three, four, five hexes away. But the, the odds of that are very slim, and it won't make them much, it won't make much difference anyway, because they will have really no ability to have any effect on, uh, the task force with uh, only one step. So we're just going to let the, but normally, depend, depending upon the operational level, um, 
they could force a Japanese player to stop at any point um, during its movement and then the Allies would get to react with the very same number of movement points spent. But we're just going to go ahead and move him one, two, three, four, and then into the hex basically. So now all these guys here are currently right there uh, in that task force. <coughs> we can unload a task force and commit to an amphibious assault if there are no enemy ships in that hex. <coughs> Let's see. When a combat unit disembarks into a hex occupied by an enemy ground unit, the disembarking player must initiate combat, whether he is the operation player or not. If the advantage player conducts the assault, he must initiate combat in the ensuing ground combat phase. If the disadvantaged player conducts the assault, he must indicate initiate combat in the ground combat phase of the next battle cycle. During this combat, the unit occupying the assault has its troop quality halved, rounding up, for the combat ratio determination only, unless a friendly ground unit already occupies the assault hex, or the assault hex is being simultaneously attacked by friendly ground units from another hex. Uh, let's see. A ground unit can disembark from a uh, transport in any friendly movement phase in the shoreline hex, even if the transport has moved, provided there is no enemy naval unit other than submarines in the hex. A ground unit can disembark from an anti, uh, a, tri uh, a transport in any friendly movement phase in a shoreline hex if there are enemy naval units in the hex, provided the transport has not moved in the current phase. So either way, we can go ahead and drop them onto Wake Island. And we will do that. So now we have transport group, the transport itself, the APD. We'll go ahead and land these guys on a wake island. <clears throat> on the left hand side is the unit's troop quality rating, on the right hand side is the unit's strength. You can see with this particular force. Uh, you may not be able to see the particular force, depends upon how well this clear this is showing, that the number to the left on the Americans is a 7 troop quality, but on the 8 it has 8 steps because <clears throat> it is a brigade. So, we have the advantage movement, that's all, the, that's all that can be done there. Next we go to the advantage air mission phase. This is where you can move your air units and declare strike missions and that type of thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this strike marker on top of these guys or well it really doesn't matter I guess. We'll just fly them. They have 16 movement points out and back. Um, so they can go one Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And seven will be fourteen, so they have plenty of uh plenty of range. They are gonna conduct a strike attack against the airfield. This is gonna be mm, I'm gonna say not the best thing they can do. They probably should have attacked the airfield first. However, Strike mission coming in. Let me see. We move the mission air units. We determine if it's detected in the hex. In a hex before the target? No. We'll see if we can detect it. Uh, is an air mission detected in or prior to the target hex? Let's see if it's detected in the, in the target hex. So we're going to roll the blue die here. We are going to try and detect it. Over here on the search, it'll be the same hex search. And we're going to roll a die on the day column and we're searching for air or on the day 
on the day half, and then this quarter we're going to be rolling on it to search for the air unit. This will mostly be important for uh, anti-aircraft or flak fire or whatever. We roll a one. So zero to three is in the green. And we're searching for air units in the green. It's detected. The it is detected for air units. So this will have an, an effect on the like I said, the who gets to fire fire first, the flak or the uh, air mission airstrike. Okay, so it is detected in or prior to so we go yes we'll designate to strike targets we are going to attack um, the I guess we'll attack the airfield try to well we're not gonna have any success against it let's go ahead and attack let's go ahead and attack the ground unit then we will have a combat air patrol procedure. Combat air patrol is basically I can launch the one air unit there, the one friendly air unit, Japanese, uh, well, the American Java, American uh, air unit. Uh, let's see, cap. Anytime a detected air mission enters a hex containing at least one enemy air unit, perform the following. The non-mission non player, or the Americans, U.S. must alert air units in the hex up to the air base launch capacity. The non-mission player can, at his option, designate one alerted one engine unit as his cap unit. If he has no alerted one engine air units, he can designate no cap. So we are going to go with a cap. Um, this unit versus this unit. Americans only have like, is it two steps or one step? Americans have a two step unit. No, they have a one step unit. My, my bad. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's see, air combat. Cap unit against escort unit and vice versa. To resolve cap versus escort, take the anti-air strength of the cap unit Modify it for any other alerted one-engine non-mission units and refer to the Air Naval CRT to determine how many hits are inflicted on the escort unit. Then take the anti-air strength of the escort unit and follow the same procedures. Intercepting unit against the missionary units. Follow the same procedure as above. No missionary unit can fire at the intercepting unit. Uh, escort unit against alerted units when there is no cap follow the same procedure as above but no alerted units can fire at the escort unit so anyway all that means is we're just going to have an air-to-air -air combat using the very same chart basically <clears throat> so let's see where we're at here alright let's tilt this down a hair Okay, so does that give me, what do we got? Cap versus an uncoordinated mission. Basically, the that's if you have two air missions <clears throat> from two different hexes uh, joining together to coordinate into one strike. So we don't have that. Let's see, but we have an uncoordinated strike versus cap or cap versus that. So we're gonna be using this line. Well, the Americans are only on the one, so they basically have to roll a zero or a one to have any effect. So we're going to roll the die, and I rolled a five, so they have no effect, and the Japanese player cannot um, retaliate. So, following our strike mission, our strike diagram here, strike mission diagram. Hmm. And where it went to? There it is. So, cap procedure. Now we have the flak procedure. 
airplanes. I'm zooming in to the against the ground unit. <clears throat> Let's see here. Flak. Anytime an air mission enters a target hex containing ground units, naval units, airfields, or ports, conduct the following procedure according to the type of air mission. Determine which units in the target hex can conduct flak combat. Uh, let's see. Airstrike mission with no activated or non activated naval targets. It's pretty much the same thing. Or an airstrike mission including or exclusively non activated naval targets. All ground units up to four activated or non activated naval units and any airfield and or port can conduct flak. Okay, so I'm going to use one of those two. With no activated or non-activated naval units, has not doesn't have that. So we're going to do the airstrike mission with ground units up to four non-activated naval units in any airfield. Okay, conduct determine the air strength of units conducting flak combat and refer to the air naval combat table. Uh, in any case. So we will just go ahead and uh, resolve flak. Now, how do we do that on strength, though? Troop quality versus strength. Flak unimproved against air, so I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, but what do we use? The allies have eight strength points. And if they have eight strength points... Flak procedure conducts the following procedure according to the type of the air mission, and it is an airstrike mission up to four. And what did we uh, figure out? What the strengths? <clears throat> well, let me determine who has uh, flak again. Up to four non-activated naval units in any airfield and or port can conduct flak. <clears throat> and uh, we determine flak strength how? Okay, it looks like ground units do not uh, contribute anything to flak combat. So, we have basically the airfield itself, which has a one flak strength. We'll be rolling on the one table or one column, whatever it is, against uh, flak versus air, not improved. And it's basically a strength of one, so it's got a roll of one or zero. So we'll go ahead and conduct flak combat. We roll a six, so there's no effect on flak combat. And that means that the airstrike will go in. It's a lot easier to do it than to talk about it and show it. Flat combat air mission conclusion procedure. And the air mission strike thing designates the target of his strike. His target can be either enemy task forces or all other units in the target hex. For instance, if a target hex contains an enemy task force, an enemy force marker, and an airfield, the mission player must designate either one task forces or two everything else. So we are attacking um, the ground unit with a strength of three. There shouldn't be any modifiers. Unless there was an extra, well, there shouldn't be any modifiers. Okay, so we're going to be on a three column, and we're shooting for, where are we at here? Versus ground. Strike versus ground, right here, just off camera. Okay, so we're going to roll the die on a three. I roll, re re roll. That one was jammed up against the corner. Well, roll the same die roll, so I guess that's fair. Um, I 
on the three column we rolled a six so four to nine is zero so there's no effect on the strike by the Japanese player it's kinda hard to get a good one get a strike unless you uh, have a full strength there unit so we will put him we'll send him back home to the Marshall Islands and then I think we'll just resolve combat. I don't think bombardment's not going to have any effect. Two light cruisers. Let me see here. Just double check. In fact, I think bombardment's mostly for. Bombardment can be used against any ground unit, airfield, or port in the hex. To perform bombardment, the player reveals whether naval units in he plans to use. The target player reveals whatever ground units he has in the hex. The bombing player, bombarding player fires each of his units individually at any targets he wishes. And when will that occur? That will occur what? It's not during the naval combat cycle, so... It must be uh, right after naval combat. You can do bombardment. Okay, that happens way before that. So yes, we can do that. We'll probably allocate the two cruisers, the two light cruisers, to bombardment. Let me double check what their uh, bombardment ratings are. Bombardment is a two. Well, they'll do the bombardment after the naval combat cycle, which <laughs> they'll be very little or nothing too. Alright, so now we'll do the naval combat cycle. The, there'd be naval combat determination if naval units existed in the same hex. There'd be one round, two rounds, and three rounds of combat. And then we have the bombardment section. Well, that came up pretty fast. <clears throat> Let's see what the light cruisers can do to bombard the ground units. Ground unit. Okay, so we do what? Fires each of his units individually at any target hex he wishes. He can fire at a target more than once, but no ground unit can be forced to make more than one troop quality check per bombardment. Refer to their combat results, ugh, results table, bombardment strength versus installation, or bombardment strength versus ground unit. All right. Where is bombardment versus ground unit? Down here. Move this up just a little bit. All right, so the Yubari class, bombardment strength of a 1, and the Tenru has a bombardment strength of a 2. A little better cruiser, I guess. Alright, so the Yubari class has a 1. And it will be rolling up here. You can't really see it, but trust me. The 1 column. Combat strength column of 1. He basically needs a zero, one, or two, and he gets a two. So following the two, okay, a two is a miss. Sorry. All right, and now the two strength, um, Tenru, Tenru class rolls a two. Okay, his two will be on the blue line. So I'm going to cross this blue line down to. Uh, let's see here and then we're gonna go down the blue line to uh, what is it? air to ground unit which is a T a T indicates a troop quality check on the American unit I'm gonna take a real quick read on that and find out what we do next okay here we go with ground combat player who initiates combat in a given hex is the attacker and his opponent is the defender. 
To resolve a ground combat, refer to the ground combat results table column determination chart. Cross-reference the attacker and defender troop qualities using the troop quality of only one unit from each side chosen by the owning players. Find the column on the main body of the table determined by the relative troop qualities and apply any necessary column shifts. Roll the die, apply any necessary modifiers, and read across on the line appropriate to the number of step, steps involved in the combat to find the result. The combat result specifies how many steps each player must remove from his force if neither side retreats. If either player is forced to retreat or chooses to retreat, follow the retreat procedure below. Well, let's go then to the troop quality check. Is there any errata on this? There is quite a bit of errata. Not that I can see. A troop quality check. This is what I need to make now before anything else happens because of the naval bombardment. Or, not naval bombardment. Uh, yes, bombardment. Sorry, my bad. They scored, uh, what, two? Uh, a T. They scored a T. Okay, well, let me get this straight here. Okay, whenever a troop quality check is called for, roll the die and compare the die roll result with the troop quality of the selected ground unit. If the die roll is equal to or less than the unit's troop quality, the unit passes the check. If the die roll is greater, the unit fails. When the... Air Naval um, Combat Table calls for a troop quality check, a T result. Make the T, TQ check normally. If the unit is immediately broken, it passes the check. Or wait a minute. If the unit makes the check, it's not already broken, and it fails the check, it is immediately broken. Okay. If it passes the check, there's no effect. If the unit making the check is already broken and has two or more steps in it, and it fails the check, it immediately loses one step and remains broken. If it passes the check or has only one step in it, there's no effect. Alright, so what we could do is make a true quality check, and I need to roll equal to or less than the American Marines true quality rating. So the Americans have a seven. American Marines. Yes, this is black print on a blue uh, blue counter, so it makes it a bit difficult. Okay, they gotta they have to roll a seven or less. Is that what I said? Equal to or less then, so I need a seven or less. And I roll an eight. Well, that's great. Looks like the uh, bombardment is uh, having an effect. Uh, if the unit making a check is not already broken and it fails, it is immediately broken. Well, let me go over here to my handy dandy uh, markers and find a broken marker. So. Uh, there's only about five million counters in this game, so it seems like. All right, we need an American broken marker. Hold on there, I'm still here. Okay, so the American unit has a broken marker placed on it. It's kind of tough leaning over the camera. All right, so the American uh, Marine unit is broken. The bombardment sends them scurrying. All right. Now what happens? The unit is broken. True quality check, it's broken. Do we do anything until the rally phase, or how will this affect uh, the ground combat that's coming? I don't think it matters at the moment until group combat. Ground combat! Ground combat! 
Silly me. All right. So we know that much. The bombardment did break the Marines at Wake. However, that doesn't seem to have any effect yet until ground combat. Which... is going to be coming up about right now. So we'll move back, uh, move here, skip the demolition phase because there's nothing, uh, no demolition in the engagement scenarios. We go to ground combat. During the ground combat phase, both players examine, one by one, each hex that contains both allied and Japanese ground units. The operation player determines the order in which the hexes are examined, and the following rules are we'll applied. Go down, now down to the ground combat resolution. The player who initiates combat in a given hex is the attacker, and his opponent is the defender. And I think I might have read that already. Um, so anyway, basically the Japanese player has his TQ um, have to four. Um, let's see, three point five four against the American uh, TQ of 7 at the moment but I gotta see how this works with broken units so we're gonna use a whole different chart here Just a moment please yeah that's exciting alright So, this will be how we determine the first part of the uh, combat. <clears throat> Using the upper portion on the table of the table, cross-reference the troop quality rating of one of the attacking units with the troop quality rating and quality of one defending unit. Note that the troop quality of a broken unit, or in some circumstances, a unit conducting an amphibious assault, must be halved. So I guess they'll both be halved. They're both uh, fours. Uh, rounding up. The number resulting from this cross-reference is a troop quality differential number, and you will use and possibly modify on the lower portion of the table to reach a combat result. So, anyway, we're going to use the ground combat uh, troop one first. So what do we got? We're basically using fours for both units. So the attacker is a four because he's amphibiously assaulting and the defender is a four because he's broken. So we'll go ahead and cross-reference the two and we get a 10. So we'll be using a 10 in the bottom half of the uh, combat results table. All right. This actually isn't that slow or whatever. It's just, you know, it's just me. Okay, we have a 10. We'll be on the 10 column at the moment. And what we will do is we will immediately remove this die out of the way so I can read the text. Using the lower portion of the table, find the troop quality differential um, for the terrain and our, uh, let's see, modify for terrain and advan uh, armor advantage, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to reach a combat result. So what we have is a 10. Use the 10 column. Roll a die and apply any applicable die roll modifications listed below the table for step for step ratio and read across. Okay, any modified thing um, modifications for call um, troop quality modifications. Unit is broken. It's halved. Or if a unit is doing amphibious assault, it's halved. Combat shifts. Jungle hills, mixed or mountain, and die roll modifications. Divide the number of attacking steps by the number of defending steps. If the ratio obtained is listed below, apply the die roll modification listed. Well, it's zero to zero that I can see. 
or steps. Well, no, because the Japanese player has one step while the American has eight. So I'm going to go what? I'm going to want to use the number of steps of the defend. Uh, Defending steps. Divide the number of attacking by defending. Okay, that's 1, 2, 8, which basically I'm guessing is 0. 0.25 or less. So we're going to add 2 to the resolution roll. So we're going to roll a die. We're going to roll a die on this column. And we're also going to... Well, actually, actually we're going to use that column, but we're going to roll the die over here. And based upon the size of the units involved, will tell us which of these three tables we need to use. I roll a zero. Hey. Okay, we roll a zero, and we're going to modify that by two, so that makes it a one, two. So the final die roll is actually a two. Based on the strengths of nine, eight plus one of nine, we're going to come down here, off screen, Die roll is two. Okay, I need to do it this way. Okay, so um, what I say, eight plus one is nine, so we're going to be using the six to sixteen column. And the die roll. Wait a minute. The die roll is a nine. I have or two. I have to use the two. Okay. Well, I'm here somewhere. Point being is that we're going to use the 6 to 16 because of the strings involved. And we're going to cross over to here, in the middle, to the 10. We have a 1 to 1. Alright, now how do we read that? For the step ratio, read across the Modify die line, appropriate to the combined attack and defense, step size to find the combat results. So, the ground combat results are in the red. Um, yes, they're in the, uh, I don't know, actually, oh, let's do it again. Actually, they're in the white. The white means optional retreat. White is optional retreat. The numbers are the steps lost. Um, note that one hit is added to the result against a broken unit that retreats. So we have attacker defender step losses of one affected by retreat and pursuit. So now I have to read the retreat and pursuit rules and optional retreat. Now let me double check this. I'll be right back. Okay, so the gist of it is both sides uh, there was an optional retreat result which meant that first the attacker and then the defender had the options to retreat um, if they chose so and neither one did. So they both sustain one um, string point loss and since there's no retreat they go ahead and take the loss and they just stay in place from what I can tell and when you're in combat the unit with the high the unit that you choose if there's multiple units in the attack or the, the defense the player has to indicate which unit is basically the lead unit or which one will make the troop quality check if there is one and it must be the one that takes the first casualties if any in this case that did not apply so the net result is one step loss for each unit now the Japanese battalion because it took a step loss um, if the unit has only one step remaining, the only player can, rather than eliminate the unit, assign step losses to any other friendly units in the hex until all steps have been taken. However, if any friendly unit must be eliminated, the unit whose troop quality was used must be eliminated first. So, in this case, even though they both took one 
uh, loss, the Japanese player is eliminated because his strength points or steps are only one. So the one hit will kill him or eliminate him and the American unit retains control of Wake Island at the moment. Like I said, there was really no place to retreat and I don't, I'd have to read the, a little farther on the amphibious assaults if the Japanese player could retreat to his ships. I'm not sure if that's possible or not. <clears throat> now we come up with airfield repair. That's the next step. Then we come up with a rally. All broken units in a hex containing no enemy ground units during the rally phase can attempt to rally simply by passing a troop quality check. As in calculating ground combat, only one broken unit's troop quality is used for all broken ground units in the hex. The broken unit whose troop quality is used for the check has its troop quality halved or round up, as always when a broken unit must make a troop check, quality check. A player can attempt to rally units in any number of eligible hexes each rally phase, but no more than one rally attempt per phase can be made in a given hex. If the rally succeeds, remove the broken marker. If the rally fails, leave the broken marker where it is and deactivate the unit. In most of the larger scenarios, you'll will come across deactivation where you have to be you have to make it to a friendly port or anchorage to deactivate that operation basically um, and it has other implications so the net result is he has to make the unit has to make a rally attempt at did I say seven or less yeah seven or less there's no troop quality. So we roll a two and the American unit rallies. So he removes a broken marker. And now he retains control or maintains control of Wake Island and thus the scenario is a loss for the Japanese player. Because after that we have rally, we have disadvantaged movement, disadvantaged air. I mean the American player could try to do something with his air unit but the range of the air unit is only a 7. Let's see, where am I at here? There's part of what I want. So we can move him out of the way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. He could just make it there, but it wouldn't uh, do him any good because he couldn't come back. He could attempt to uh, attack the... Naval Task Force in the Hex, I guess, but don't know if I want to go to all that much trouble. <clears throat> so, because the only thing is, he either controls it or he doesn't, the Japanese player. So, anyway, the first invasion of Wake Island is a Japanese loss, and that's how it was historically. So, I will be coming back later with... The Relief of Wake Island, which is a battle scenario, and it'll be a little bit longer and a little bit more involved, and hopefully I'll have the rules down a little bit better, and the quality will be a little bit better. Anyway, I think I've blabbed enough. This is Pacific War, First Invasion of Wake Island, Engagement Scenario Number 3, The End.